bit of progress was made a couple of years later um, in a commercial sort of basis, the case of wireless night again. And you'll see what they've done there. They've got, as is this point, they've done what, with many commercial things, particularly sizable ones, there's a, an acceleration of, of processes. So it might start off with area managers or technical directors and then go up to the board and then go up to there. And this accelerated, ultimately, as you can see, the matter is not resolved through negotiation. The party shall attempt in good faith to resolve the dispute or claim through an alternative dispute resolution procedure recommended to the parties by the Centre for Dispute Resolution. However, an ADR is being followed should not prevent any part of the Commission of Proceedings. So the court did think that this was sufficient to be uh, binding. The agreement permitted the parties to litigate at the same time as any ADR. Um, that certainly puts pay to any concerns about housing the jurisdiction of the court, but of course it could militate against the ADR, but it was seen not to on this occasion because it didn't lack any intention to this intention that the clause was to be binding. I put later on in the notes, we'll see, that ideally the clause should be in um, sort of what's referred to as Scott and Avery form. Um, when the common law principles for arbitration were being developed before we got onto the Arbitration Acts, <coughs> one of the things the court wanted was arbitration to be a condition precedent to litigation. So if it's going to be going to give rise to a stay, if it's going to be binding on the parties, it should be seen that the parties intended before they did litigate, they had to go through this process. And I would advise, certainly, when drafting mediation laws, notwithstanding the decision came from Wallace, that you do make, make it sort of scoff and ably compliant in that way. There was certainty in this case because the parties had identified and specified the procedure to be used, that was the CEDA procedure. So there was an identified and agreed framework. Public policy and CPR pointed to the enforcement of the clause, and where the court had discretion to enforce its own this kind. A strong clause would have to be shown before the client to exercise its discretion to the proceedings. So there's some, some good progress there. So what I suggest there is that the term is as simple as possible in the mouth of agreement to mediate rather than simply negotiating for a claim. If you feel the need to express some sort of uh, obligation in the way that people engage in the process, I would suggest best endeavours, which is a term that the courts can far more receptive to and expand the way of of enforcing a meaningful way in other, in other areas of law, rather than good faith. Um, when you look at the way that it's being dealt with in Australia, um, quite an interesting case to have a look at is this Hooper Bowling case. And the court was rejecting many of the traditional concerns over mediation clause. Really what the court came up with was that it felt that rather than enforcing cooperation and consent between the parties, which the English courts would like, that's too, too, too touchy-feely, too difficult to police. The court considered itself to actually be enforcing participation in an identifiable process that could involve or result in cooperation and consent. So you can see already, just from the short uh, cases that we've looked at, sort of um, indicia that your term needs to have. This, this ability to police it, this ability to have an identifiable procedure, something you can point to. So what I said there is the term of identified set out the structure and procedural aspects of the mediation. Um, and that can be done by, as in the other case, incorporating the ADR groups, procedure, the essential dispute resolution groups, procedure, uh, and other procedures. No further agreement should be required, or the procedure should provide a solution. I've put two examples. There have been cases where, for example, in an Australian case, the choice of mediator was one where the parties ran into difficulty because uh, it didn't bode particularly well. They couldn't agree on the mediator, and uh, they didn't have a, an identified procedure for resolving that, which is a shame, because it'd be pretty straightforward by, for example, asking one of the recognized bodies, such as ADR group, to appoint a mediator if the parties can't agree on the identity. So just in short, if you're importing somebody else's procedure or framework, that everything is covered. And in the event that something isn't covered, that there is a way of agreeing. So an agreed split of the fees, it might be with a multi-party mediation that's pretty involved. The parties might quite rightly take the view that simply splitting them up equally, splitting the fees equally, wouldn't be appropriate. One party might be very, have a very minor involvement, other parties significant involvement, why should they pay equal fees? So just ensure that you have a mechanism for this to be resolved if the parties can't agree. 
I also, my own view is again from looking at the cases and the authorities, that a timetable is particularly important. And it comes back to this issue of the court being concerned whether it can identify breach or compliance. That's always the court's certainty, really, it seems to be contractual certainty is no more than saying, can the court in relation to this term determine whether it has been breached or complied with? I would have thought as a minimum you would want a long stop for this exercise to take place. Um, and certainly an identical time period uh, which it ought to commence. So there ought to be a fixed date by which the parties should have got on and commenced their mediation process, and there ought to be a long stop by which it is completed. That doesn't necessarily need to be a hostage fortune because it seems to me if you are mediating and it is going well, but you are on the edge of your, your time period, then it must be within the parties. It must be within their ability to agree that the extension of the be. But what, what you're looking for when you're drafting the, the clause is really to sit down and think about if think what could go wrong and how would the court determine whether or not it be compliant with. So having to look, identify the time period is a good way of doing that. So it says that ensure it's possible to identify when the obligation is complete, whether successful or unsuccessful, and whether the terms have been complied with, and double check if you're incorporating organisation procedures and no further be required. I put up there the Scott Navy case, which I mentioned earlier on, which is that you would I think you would want to draft your course to say that mediation is a condition precedent to go to litigation. And that I would say it was essential. If you're ever going to be in a position where you want to apply to the court for a stay of any proceedings for mediation, you haven't got that sort of initial precedent angle to your term. It's extremely unlikely the court would be willing to grant any sort of stay uh, before a party could get on with litigation. <coughs> so, that is it really. That's a, a fairly brief review. Um, there isn't that much in the way of, of English cases. Um, on this point. There's no particular case at the moment that I can see and I'm aware of where the courts have to wrestle with the issue of the stay. Um, if you can't get a stay of the litigation, um, the only other alternative is remedies for breach, but it seems to me it'd be almost impossible to quantify what your loss would be if somebody breached a mediation clause. You can already rely upon a party's uh, unreasonable refusal to take part in mediation during a costs exercise. So quite how you would uh, calculate your, your quantum of loss if somebody breached a mediation clause is difficult to identify. And that seems to me must support the other type of relief, which would be the injunction to stop the party from rushing off to litigation. If you have, if you have difficulty in assessing what your loss would be, that's one of the reasons why the court would move towards, it seems to me, around the injunction to restrain the seals. But, as I said, headlines are, can the court see it as being complied with can the court see it be breached and really be as specific as possible in terms of the mechanism and the procedure and the framework? And you've got a fighting chance, it seems to me, that you'll have a binding mediation clause such that it would be extremely difficult for one part that doesn't want to take part um, to resist it. Just, sorry. All I was going to say, the other thing is, and I'm, don't, I'm not going to ask for at the moment, um, just because I like to have my two pens. I put there at the back my top tips on mediation, which you can accept or reject as you see fit. Anyway, I'll hand you over now uh, to there. I'm going to invite.